People, we're completely out yeah. of pocket tonight because Brendan's not here, and also we just yeah. we needed to catch up and talk. So you guys are gonna yeah, just gonna enjoy the two of us being uh, our normal obtuse selves. So and enjoy the cuts yes. that make no sense. <laughs> hey, it's chaos incarnate. There you what go. You know? Bas- basically, yeah, it's a crossover. We just need one of your buddies, which you could invite them. Yes. You're allowed. So. Oh, I I, I, pro- I probably will invite Zach at some point in time. That'd be that, fun. That's perfectly fine. So, anyway. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so the... So y- you know that uh, every, uh, every Monday we are doing a swing dance class. I've told you this before, right? I think so, yeah. Yeah, so a bunch of friends of mine, a uh, b- bunch of friends of me get together do swing dance class we've been doing it for probably three months now something ish Mm -hmm. like that Mm -hmm. and it's been super super fun because like it's been difficult because i'm not used to dancing that type of dance before uh, and all that type of stuff but it's been really fun to dance people go back and forth all that fun stuff and it's social dancing which i've thought needs to make a comeback for a long time well Yesterday, uh, Miss Ashley didn't want to heat up the barn uh, for, you know, three hours or something like that because it's cold here. Mm -hmm. And so we decided to try a a swing, uh, a swing dance, like dance class, beginner's dance class uh, that's downtown Oklahoma Mm -hmm. City. Okay. And we went and it was kind of exactly what I was expecting in that it's very gay. (laughs) Yeah. Like, very, very, uh, honestly, that's the best way I can describe it. Yeah. Uh, they don't believe in gender dancing and all, all that all that fun mm-hmm. stuff. And so you had a couple of the guys who were on the feminine side and all. Uh, then, because there was a lot more girls than guys, there were a couple of girls, including Liberty Friend, um, who uh, was on the, uh, like, leading side, masculine side. But the, the entire atmosphere was get very gay. And so I've been flip-flopping between two different two different thoughts. The two thoughts are, I never want to do that again. <laughs> and we need to get an army of conservative Christian homeschoolers together and just change the atmosphere of this place. Hmm. Just bring all of the homes, uh, conservative Christian homeschools together and... Uh, you know, try to take over the place because it's a beautiful venue. It's mm-hmm. great. And they, they seem to care about the history of swing dancing. And the thing that make, gives me hope that that might actually happen is that the non-gender dancing thing, uh, the lady who was talking to us about the history of swing dance said, that's less than five years old. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So it's less than five years old. The concrete hasn't set yet. Right. We can change stuff. Right. Right. What do you do in that situation? So this because on one hand it's really awkward dancing with a like six foot five black guy, right? Who's very obviously gay, right? On the other hand, I feel like it's worth trying to save, right? Yeah, totally. Um, so coming at this, I, I gotta I gotta bring in a bit of the DJ stuff to this. Um, you tell me how yeah, much totally. much of your intro you want in there, um. <laughs> in the final discussion, but, um, basically my thing is this, you basically have two levels of, um, people who can actually say no to that kind of a thing. One is the person actually running the vet, the event, the ticketer. Um, and then the other is the MC. Um, now those could be the same person. But those are basically the two stops at any party, any class, any sort of situation like this where there is social dancing of any sort. Um, They set the rules. If you break the rules, music stops and you're either embarrassed and embarrassed into stopping um, or you're kicked out. That's the way you control a situation as a DJ or as an owner. Um. Granted, that's a top-down solution. I don't know that bottom-up solutions are going to work in those situations because 
it is actually very much the bard, the artist, the band, whatever the DJ, whatever you want to call it, who ultimately calls the shots in a social right. dance setting. Okay, you, you you following what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, I think we need more DJs and bards and bands that will say no. Okay. So and they'll say no the, not the, only the to the owners. Build your own thing. Right. And and I am. Okay. I am because the the DJ has to say, so the DJ, this is, this goes, goes to another end of inappropriateness. You got your bumping and grinding and you've got your inappropriate lyrics, right? Yeah. Okay. There was a certain amount my father tolerated, especially in adults mm -hmm. over 30, over 40 kind of groups mm -hmm. that get yeah. heavily inebriated as mm -hmm. part of the business there was a point to where he had to stop music even on them and say let's keep it pg-13 yeah. right uh-huh um and the reason he had to do that was for security purposes even beyond anyone else's dignity and whatever else you know like obviously we can think of that because we're sober we're you know dealing with drunk people like we have yeah. a stop sign that we can throw up by pausing the music and yeah. saying hey going a little mm -hmm. too hard here we only had to do that with adults yeah. a few times kids all the time every party at least once right and usually kids are smart enough to be like oh I don't want to be embarrassed again. <laughs> you see what I'm so, saying? So let's not let's not do that again. Right. It actually works. Right, right, exactly. Now, as far as the owner is concerned, that's probably a top-down thing from the owner, in which case you as a bard, as a DJ, as whatever you want to call it, a band, et cetera, et cetera, as the music the music provider uh, and the MC mm -hmm. provide the MC, you yourself are not going to um stand idly by and work with and partner with people like that mm -hmm. right yeah uh and so you have things in your contract these are the kinds of parties i don't do my father specifically had in his mm -hmm. contract all music music is played at the discretion of the dj and if it is clear that mm -hmm. we are being physically threatened in any way to continue to play do whatever our our, our, our equipment is attacked mm -hmm. blah 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 the contract is void and we're gone you know, mm -hmm. um, yeah. very basic stuff. And this is stuff that we don't think about because as consumers, these are the grip, like in filmmaking, these are the grips. These are the lighting experts. These are the cameramen. Yeah. These are the people who are actually doing the thing. Yeah. Okay. Most of that is blue collar people. Most of yeah. that is conservative people. And we as conservatives are not standing up to owners and we are not standing up to consumers and we get stuck in the middle and we think, oh, peer pressure, blah, blah, blah. Right. So I'm not saying that that's definitely the case for whoever you're dealing with. They may all be on the same page with this sort of thing. But to me, mm -hmm. the only real way to fight this thing culturally is to make mm -hmm. an alternative. Make an all. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because so, if something so basically yeah. just continue with what we've already been doing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and if and, you, uh, yeah. the, 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 the people who are hosting the thing are a nonprofit. So they're all volunteers. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it seems like they're all of the same mind. So. Right. So I figured uh. that would probably be the case being downtown, but like, that's the thing. If you want to specifically compete with them, you do it downtown at the same time at a different location. Uh huh. You go that hard <laughs> and you make it better yeah. and you make it better music. You make it a better atmosphere. You make it uh, uh, cheaper. You make it better uh, uh, refreshments, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Like this is yeah. you, I don't think we as Christians understand the importance of making good parties. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Absolutely, and, and that, that's that's kind of what it all boils down to. And and making good parties includes fighting off the people who will liberalize the party. Like, it, yeah. the social dancing is a microcosm of government. 
You need yeah, you absolutely. you need absolutely you is. need good sheriffs DJs mm -hmm. to rule the dance floor righteously and to properly uh, 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 reward those who do well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and 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 punish those who do evil. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> and see, this is from a guy who who DJed from eleven to twenty four years old. Yeah. Right. Like I saw yeah. this firsthand that millions of parties, you know, like not millions, but thousands of parties mm -hmm. legitimately probably over, I would say between one and 2000 parties in my lifetime. Um, maybe mm -hmm. more, I don't know, but it's crazy, man. Like the, I, I, I briefly touched on this in like a general report a while ago, but the thing is mm -hmm. like a great party actually you know it it's it is a an icebreaker and a spark between males and females which is what kind of what you're most interested in sure but the other thing yeah. i think people don't really understand is the ebenezer of a party yeah Par parties are ebenezers in your life whether yeah. you want them to be or not they are going to be times to remember and if mm -hmm. If you do them rightly, they will be good and glorious and wonderful. If you don't, they will be the worst possible times of your life. Everything gets turned up to 11 at a party and you see people for who yeah. they really are. You know, um, <laughs> I, I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm wanting to branch off into really wide areas, but I think I feel like I need to get nailed back yeah. down a little bit. But yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I'm good with branching off into wide areas, but like what you were saying um some th th this is what's giving me hope for not not the reconquista thing but the uh, uh like actually we're doing it where the, the dance practice is paying off right. is that uh some friends of ours had a it was actually during the last broadcast why i couldn't be there um but they had a party that was ostensibly a spoons tournament you okay. Know, spoons, card game. Yeah. You, know, you pass cards, try to get four. Don't be the person without a spoon at the end. Right. And in our friend group, spoons gets violent. <laughs> it gets violent. There have been several times that people have ended up wrestling on the floor, jumping over the table, that type <laughs> of stuff. It, it's it is intense spoons tournament play. Okay. Yeah. And so this one uh, was less intense than uh, most of them have been in the past, and. That's because about halfway through, the Spoons tournament uh, degenerated or I, I became better because we were playing some good music in the background. And we all said, I feel like we should be dancing to this. Mm -hmm. And we had all been to dance practice. And so we all started dancing. Right. And yeah. it spontaneously turned into a dance party. Yeah, totally. That's... Which was amazing and fantastic and incredible. Yeah. And that's exactly what I want parties to be. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I... So... I hesitate to be terribly optimistic about this, but it seems like, at least inside of my friend group, it's working. Right. Because that that's what we're ultimately going for. We're going right. for, oh, yeah, we should probably be dancing here. Let's dance. Ask somebody to dance and just swing. Right. Or ballroom dance or whatever, you, whatever you're learning to do. Mm -hmm. But that seems like the ultimate goal. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I'm with you on couples dance specifically um, being super important, but I think that there's a push against all sorts of uh, improvisational group. I, I would say group dancing more than solo dancing. Like a lot of people kind of, you know, look at, look at dance as, as like um, they would say group dancing is line dancing. And I would say, no, there's a lot of spontaneous things like conga lines and other sorts of things that can break out properly yeah. um within a everybody dance now kind of situation right like everyone freestyle do what you do enjoy the music feel the music go for it um yeah the thing that needs to be tempered is you need a good dj who can keep an eye on yeah. things and specifically tailor and this is where spotify mm -hmm doesn't have ai <laughs> eyes yet <laughs> to where it can go yeah <laughs> okay who is in this group what do they know what mm -hmm. do they like etc cetera, etc cetera. and i'm not yeah. saying spotify could never get there but i'm saying like that's that's a thing where when you are being gifted 
a party from someone who is curating the music and knows the people, it can be um, a great DJ can keep people on the floor for a dozen songs in a row. You know what I mean? Like, and these people go harder and faster and longer than they've ever gone in any kind of workout in their life. And they're just having oh, yeah. the greatest time of their life. And it yeah. builds bonds and memories and all this other sort of stuff. And that goes for little kids as well as adults, as well as older folk. Like, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, One sec. Yeah, There's totally. A book. I need a quote. You can keep talking. Well, like... I was gonna mention the thing that I mentioned. You got zoomed in briefly. Is that the 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 stage thing? Yeah. Yep. Center okay. stage. Yeah, yeah. Um, the thing with the the thing that I was gonna mention from the general's report is the song "Move It Like This" by the Baja Men, which was our closer. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We would say, "Can you move it like this?" And they'd follow along with us, wave wave the hands, and then they'd scream, "I can shake it like that." And the song. Yeah sings that on the chorus, and then it fades out on the chorus. The song fades out on the chorus. And then my dad would count down because my character is Big Dog. That's the the, char the DJ character that I did. They knew me as Big Dog. It was on my hat, whatever. And th my dad would count down and tell them before the song started, I'm going to count down at the end. Five, four, three, two, one. And I want a Big Dog howl, right? So we would howl and 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 they'd follow along. And the thing with is the song fades out and everyone becomes aware like this is just a group of people having a blast all of yeah. everything just slowly gets stripped away and it reveals the the you know the the feeling of we accomplished something here <laughs> that's that's the only way i can really yeah. describe it you know so go with yeah. your book <clears throat> I, i'm still trying to find it well i was just going to say like generally speaking um that's what a good party should make you feel like something was accomplished mm -hmm. here tonight even if you didn't specifically become closer with anyone in particular, um, yeah. even if you didn't, you know, have some kind of actually life-changing experience, mm -hmm. just the act of dancing with a group of friends and it bringing you closer together and you enjoying the music really and yeah. truly does connect you to something further, further up and further in. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And and, and it, yeah, and people are afraid of that because of what it could turn into. But that's why yeah. you need good sheriffs, you need good bards, you need yeah. good good people watching over these parties. Yeah. It's absolutely. it's not hard. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it's and it's not chaperones. It, yeah, that's the other thing. It's not yeah. chaperones. It's are people who are tailoring the event mm -hmm. to bring maximum enjoyment with minimal yeah. uh ostentatiousness yeah right like yeah, and and, and min minimal evils minimal everything like all minimal on that end but maximum enjoyment yeah and that's that, that's been a lot easier for our monthly get-togethers that we've been having for like three years four years five five years now dang it's been it's been <laughs> a long time um but uh because we're all generally conservative Christian homeschoolers and it's a pretty small group. Like I think right. we've maybe broached 30 once. Mm. Mm -hmm. So small group, relatively self-regulated. There's been a couple of times, especially earlier on where, okay, if you're going to keep talking politics, you have to go outside. Right. That right. type of thing. Yeah. Um, I bet none of you can figure out who was involved in those <laughs> conversations. Um, but, uh, but that's, it's been a lot easier in that situation, mm -hmm. which has been very interesting and very good. I feel the thing that I, uh, the quote that I was bringing up. Uh, so this is out of the ashes, rebuilding American culture by Anthony Eslin. Fantastic book. Probably my second favorite book of la actually probably my favorite book that I read last year as far as like new books. But uh, this is chapter eight, I believe, playing upon the waters, bringing back play to or bringing play back to life. Mm. Uh, and this is page 158 in the hardback version. It says, we may think of it this way. How many hours do young people in college spend churning the pedals on bicycles that climb no hills or roll along no old roads? 
or pulling the oars on a rowing machine that travels along no river, or heaving up heavy things and putting them down again without a single stone being laid upon a stone. Now ask how many hours they spend dancing the Virginia Reel or the Waltz. Don't ask which really causes the healthy heart to race. Yeah. Con contrasting the different types of active... Basically, real, uh, actual activities and non-activities. Right. Fake activities. Mm -hmm. And that that's what I want to do. And I, 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 ho I hope that I hope that people will actually start joining in on this and pushing forward towards this goal. Yeah, because it's actually incredibly important to bring back this. We, we found we found this out in 2020, and this is what everybody says. This is not anything new at all. That we kind of need community, mm -hmm. and a big part of that is church. We yes. we, we kind of need church. Yes, but I'd say a not bigger, not equally big, but similarly sized part of that is we got to bring back like social interaction again mm -hmm. in venues like this. And ho homeschoolers have a bad view of parties because we watch movies and TV shows <laughs> and they're like, oh, parties. Yeah, not a thing. But we don't like Footloose because doing, it, we, we don't like Footloose because it paints us in a bad light. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but. We, uh, but at the same time, we watch, you know, insert popular high school TV show here. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 Euphoria is the big one right now that I have heard nothing about except it's high school and bad. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I've heard but, less. <laughs> yeah, it's high school and bad, basically. <laughs> run, run your mind there. But that that's what we picture whenever we think parties. Not... We're literally meeting in a barn with a dance floor. <laughs> right. That that's that's what we're doing, and I, I feel like that needs to make a comeback. And right. I feel like more people are waking up to that fact. We just happen to be like five years early. Mm -hmm. But the people who are waking up to that fact are not around us, or are, right. are not you know in central Oklahoma, and this is not something that can be done over the internet. This has to be done in local community, which is why I harp on that so flipping much. You know what's really a good, for people who are still trying to grasp the concept of what we're talking about, a really what? good uh, illustration would be <clears throat> the dance sequences through the song, Through Heaven's Eyes in the Prince of Egypt. Yes, I just watched that like two days ago. Yeah, a bunch of people have been, it's been getting, going around the, uh, 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 reaction channels and stuff again lately i think it's because they awesome announced at some point they're doing a live action remake which seems hilarious because it, the animation was sort of like a, a, an animation version of the ten commandments in a way <laughs> kind of sort of yeah. uh, but um at least that's kind of they were trying to make it as grand as the ten commandments let's put it that way and i think hollywood they, is yeah. creatively bankrupt christians go make your own stuff yeah totally so um but the point being that that sequence um, actually shows multiple kinds of dance. It yeah. shows uh, spontaneous solo individual dancing. It shows seductive mm -hmm. dancing from Zipporah, yeah. like properly yeah. seductive yes, dancing in a way that is not um, uh, uh, over the top or, or you know, yeah. uh, uh evil in any really any way right um yeah. and then you've got the line dancing and the follow join in and follow along dancing you've got all of the mm -hmm. above and throughout it the whole thing is just tinged with this bursting forth of joy that's yeah. the whole point i think when scripture says that we are to dance especially in worship service situations i think more than anything else even though breaking into hey, everybody, let's do this line dance together where everybody knows the rules and we follow along. While that's, while that's a thing, I think that we as conservatives, particularly reformed individuals in those sorts of situations we're, and, and fundamentalist circles too, we, not hyper-fundamentalist, but the ones that would actually enjoy dancing of any variety, it's yeah. always everything has to be perfectly structured. And the point of dancing is structure within the expression yeah 
not expression it, it, within the structure. Yeah. Right? Um, now, there's I, things that are clearly out of bounds, very clearly against God's rules. Yeah. But David danced so hard his clothes fell off and he was not condemned by God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, he condemned his wife and she was actually <laughs> punished by God. For yeah. saying you danced and your clothes fell off, how dare you? <laughs> mm-hmm. So, like, I'm not saying go dance and make your clothes fall off, but uh, I think that our comfort levels, especially as cold and Nordic Westerners, <laughs> really, really need to change. That's one of the reasons I love the Spanish. And I love how yeah. the Spanish approach dance. Mm-hmm. There is tons of structure within all kinds of sorts of Spanish dance. Mm-hmm. But it depends on what music is playing. Mm -hmm. It depends on the individuals and what they're feeling for the evening. Yeah. And it is all based upon expression of emotion. Like it really is at at its heart. There's structures for that expression. But therefore the expression, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. And the... So... I'm very much in the, I have to know the rules. I have to know the theory. I, I, yeah. I don't, I'm That's not, not a good bad at improv. Thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not good at improv and I need to get better at it and I'm working on it. But yeah. the thing that I, this is why uh, specifically Zach uh, and I are doing this. Cause we've had, we've had this level of conversation. I haven't had this level of conversation with uh, everybody at the dance uh at our dance practices but why we're doing it is so that we can get good at it so that our kids can learn it from whenever they're kids instead of whenever they're you know 18 and 21 years old and it's more difficult to learn stuff yeah because i'm having trouble with really simple swing yeah stuff, right? Re- really simple swing moves because i'm learning this this year right or last year I, I, I learned I learned this stuff last year, and it's tough for me to get my mind around the language. Right. And if you don't have a good grasp of the language, it's difficult to be spontaneous in a good way. Sure, totally. Because the the, the reason you and I are able to talk spontaneously, like there, there's not mm-hmm. structure to this, is because we know the language. Right. The reason two dancers are able to dance spontaneously and have it make sense, look good, be good, whatever. Um, is because they know the language. Right. So everybody has, we, we need people who are willing to go through the hardship of learning the language of dance and being bad at it for a long time. And you're very clearly saying the language as in the physical language, not as much the lingo. Yeah, yeah not, not not necessarily the lingo. Right. But like just the physical language of, okay, I, I'm, I'm doing rock step, triple step, triple step, rock right. step, triple step, out and... Right. Yeah, th- mm-hmm. that type of stuff. Yep. That language. Yep. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it's tough, but yeah. it's good if we have any hope of making this world a better place for our children. This is, I think this is where it is. Oh, totally. It's in the restoration of community. This is what we as Gen Z people, I know that you're a millennial, but what we as Gen Z people need to be doing. Oh, because yeah. Because if we don't, if we don't get this right... We're kind of at a turning point, it seems. I took swing dance from 05 to 07 or so. Mm -hmm. And I say took. I wasn't actually in the classes. I just showed up to events and learned them there kind of thing. They had official classes like weekly and stuff, but I couldn't afford it. And so I just kind of learned through osmosis. But Mm -hmm. it was easier for me because I knew a lot of hip hop dance. And there's not a ton of Mm -hmm. crossover. But there's understanding counting measures <laughs> and, and and you got one, two, three, four, you know, beats usually, yeah. right? On most songs. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can figure out how to put everything together and make it work. Um yeah. the there's there's a an unwillingness to move past the structure once you learn it for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And Including me. Right. (laughs) And so when I say that's okay, that you're used to that and that's your comfort zone, dance is specifically meant to push you outside of your comfort zone. From the beginning when you start and you know nothing, 
to further on. And that's one of the great things about it is that it pushes you out of your comfort zone. Um, yeah. Yet still requires much discernment, not only for yeah. what will be aesthetically pleasing from your movements, not only will this destroy my knees, <laughs> will this move destroy my knees, not only all of that, but also is this going to be uh, too... Uh, suggestive a move is this going to be yeah. you know um uh and not just for your own body but uh helping your neighbor right whether whether you are yeah. couples dancing or singles dancing in a group right um yeah and so the thing is it's also learning to follow instruction it's also learning you know music appreciation i don't think music appreciation in particular is harped on enough in dance circles amongst homeschoolers. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I, I want to hear, I want to hear more on this. Okay. One of the big ones. Uh, okay. Swing dancing. Swing dancing requires a certain kind of music. Um, yes. at a certain rough tempo, uh, the measure a uh, time measure and, uh, certain instruments, usually that sort of a thing. Mm -hmm. The problem is many groups that I have seen, including the one that I was involved in years ago, um, and the people who I see now in many places, is one of two things. <clears throat> one, you can only dance to the classics. We are classics only, and the reason we're classics only is because everything else is bad. You don't need to ask questions. It's just the way it is. <laughs> so there's that that side. And then there's the side mm -hmm. where they don't say anything about it, and they play everything. And as a result, the only things the kids like is the stuff that actually has bass in the recording because it helps mm -hmm. you move your feet. And as a result, yeah. they know Big Bad Voodoo Daddy and no other, uh, no other bands. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, yeah. I've, I've seen both. And okay. it's my opinion that a DJ, a bard, a music a, a selector needs mm. to have a plan for introducing music much the same way a choir director needs to be introducing new music to stretch the boundaries and tastes of their choir. And to specifically talk about it with the other individuals outside of practice in order to mm -hmm. get their thoughts and opinions and to maybe say, well, did you notice this about the song? Did you notice this yeah. about the song? And actually yeah. have conversation about the music instead of just, oh, I think I know this one. Yeah, I, oh wait, I do. It's yeah. that one riff. I really love this song, this one song, right? Um, yeah. Music is inherently connected with listening <laughs> that seems like a, yeah. a foregone conclusion in dancing we're not only just supposed to it's not just a graph for us to put our steps on yeah the music is there for our listening enjoyment in order yeah. to help us craft our steps around mm -hmm. it right yeah. and so this this is something that i find a lot of young people because they did not grow up in a music appreciating home uh -huh. do not they don't connect with this <laughs> and instead they're more interested in the physical activity going on based on a graph of four four time signature <laughs> at a certain tempo yeah. than they are actually listening to and enjoying the music and singing along with it yes. and all the other sorts of things that come along with it we, we miss that we miss that part of the beauty you know because we're here for dancing. So interesting. <laughs> yeah, that, that's so interesting that that's your experience because that is the polar opposite of what we are doing with uh, our dance class. Glad because to hear it. <laughs> no, no, number one, there isn't technically a DJ. Like Miss right. Ashley will choose a song occasionally, or she'll say, "Okay, we're doing Christmas music because this is Christmas right. themed," right? Um, or something like that. But uh, my sister and our friend. Uh, are the ones who make made the swing playlist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it includes everything from big band Disney mm -hmm. to legitimate big band right. to jazz standards Good. to Hamilton. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because swinging to, uh, oh, what is it? Oh. Uh, 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 gun, uh, guns and Ships. 
Guns and Ships is great. Yeah, I could see Guns and Ships. Fast. Well, the other one that I was thinking of is that you could do is, uh, so what did I miss? (laughs) What did I miss? That that, that one's faster on beat than Guns and Ships is. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But, I mean, that's the type of stuff that we do, uh, we dance to. And there's been several times that while we're, while we're dancing, we're like, oh, this song. Oh, yeah, this has a great beat. Yeah, yeah. And then we get on it. And yep. it, it works. It's fantastic. That's so wonderful. That, that's so interesting that that's that, that that's your experience with that. Because, mm-hmm. like, oh, we're completely outside of the mainstream. This is literally just the dance teacher that we have all had since we were like three. Right. Saying, well, we're all older now. Most of you aren't doing ballet anymore. Let's do this. Right. It's not inside of any structures. Well, I like that. So, that's that's yeah. That's got a lot of promise in and of itself. So that's good. Um, but I, I definitely have seen one or the other. Um, yeah. And I have seen groups that are split between one and the mm-hmm. other. Right. Um, yeah. they're the people who are like, yeah, I'm not going to dance to any big, bad voodoo daddy. Cause they're not the classics. This isn't true swing. <laughs> you know, they're, they're elitists. And then the people who are like, just, eh, I don't know about this one. It seems really old. <laughs> and I'm like, How swing dancing is old. About- how do you get elitist about swing dancing? This was literally right? like the rebellious speakeasy stuff. What are you doing? I mean, there are. <sighs> okay, so every genre I understand has its get gatekeepers. About everything. Yeah, every yeah. genre has its gatekeepers, and quite I'm not frankly, not against gatekeeping. Yeah, there at least definitionally, I think gatekeeping is mm-hmm. really important, and this might spin further into music. But um, one of the big genres that. I'm constantly reminding people that the definition has ballooned to an exponential degree and almost nothing that is counted in the genre now is actually in the genre is emo. (laughs) I was there in high school for emo. I actually did not like emo. Most of it. Um, but you're, you're just looking at everybody saying, do not cite the deep magic to me, which <laughs> right. I was there when it was written. <laughs> I was there when it was written and I was still into hair metal. So that's a whole other thing. Anyway, <laughs> as far as rock music goes. Um, but here, here's the thing. So like when you think emo, what's a band or a song that comes to mind? The literal only one is My Chemical Romance. Okay. That's it. Yeah. They were. That, that's literally it. And see, they were at the very tail end of what I consider the actual emo era. Um, mm-hmm. And the main reason I think they get put in that category is because of like one or two songs that are actually emo that they've done. Most of what they actually did was more pop emo, pop punk uh, sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um and they sort of stretched the emo when they started they were more emo into more of a um pop punk scene pop punk started as like skater punk right in the i mean skater punk started a long time ago but like it was really popularized in all the small things by blink 182 right and that's like yeah. l- late 90s early 2000s and then you had emo right around 9-11 so you're looking at right around the same period right there was some emo before 9-11 but it's not it didn't really become emo until 9-11 mm-hmm. and so emo is different from your nickelbacks your creeds your things like that even though they get slotted into it sometimes and it's different than your pop punk the quintessential emo song in my mind is the reason by hoobastank and it is okay. a piano ba- it is a piano ballad heart like with some rock distorted guitar in there higher vocal guy um that hit the, the lyrics are i'm sorry that i hurt you there there's many things i wish i didn't do but i continue learning the uh and, and it keeps going And so I have to say before I go that I want you to know I found a reason for me to change who I used to be, a reason to start over new, and the reason is you. This, uh, on one one end of the spectrum, this is more the more tame side of emo that's more specifically emotional. And then the other side of that would be something like, cut my life into pieces, this is my last resort, 
right? That's Papa Roach. Mm -hmm. Okay. There was a specific emphasis on self-harm, uh, not explicitly in lyrics, but in the culture. Mm -hmm. And it was focused mainly on being sad and depressed as part of your overall aesthetic and way of life because the world sucks. Okay. Hence why it came about after 9-11. Right. And why it was entitled Emo. It's short for Emotional. Mm -hmm. And it's not emotional, yeah. like you're putting a lot of emotion into it. Mm -mm. No, <laughs> it was yeah. it was grunge 2.0, where grunge was more along the lines of nothing really matters, man, in the 90s, mm -hmm. right? And then the emo people were going, oh wow, nothing really does matter, mm -hmm. right? It was it was an actual yeah. like doubling down on the nihilism that came from grunge yeah and so when it i hear nihil it, it was philosophical nihilism and mm -hmm. then actual worldview nihilism yes actual action nihilism people cutting their wrists mm. doing insane yeah. things you know um suicide etc cetera, etc cetera, and basically mm. like cry for help yeah and <clears throat> it evolved and we eventually got My Chemical Romance and, you know, all kinds of other stuff started getting included in the genre like Fall Out Boy and, you know, <laughs> things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I have to sit there and go, mm, it's not emo. <laughs> right. I hate hearing that and hearing that there are kids now in kindergarten who instead of like we had growing up like disco night, they have emo night. <laughs> And I'm just like, <laughs> people don't realize because <laughs> they're just yeah. thinking it's like, you know, colorful streaks in the hair and the, the, the eye yeah. makeup and whatever else. Yeah. yeah. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. <laughs> okay. So I, I could, I could be wrong on this, but the, the way that you just told that story reminds me of Knox Unplugged mm -hmm. where like one of the really early ones, like episode two or three, mm -hmm. where Jason is talking about metaphysics. Okay. And how the entire study of metaphysics just died after World War II because of Heidegger. Like yep. he Heidegger took the metaphysics that everybody Heidel? was saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or Heigl? Heidegger. It wasn't Heigl. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. It was uh, taking Hegelian metaphysics. Okay, and it was someone after running Heigl. It out okay. to the nth, Hegel, yeah, whatever. Running, running it out to the nth conclusion. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, okay. Whenever you actually take the metaphysics, whenever you actually take metaphysics of the world that we're building out to the edge, it's just a dark pit. Right. It's literally just nothing. Right. And so everybody got really scared off of metaphysics whenever that happened and just stopped studying metaphysics. Mm -hmm. So is that the same thing that happened with emo? And yes. is there a connection there or am uh, there's I just a there's a connection story structuring things? There, no, no, totally. There's a connection. Um so I'm not sure of the exact period of that. If you want to look it up, cool. But basically, like... That was World War II. The fir uh, okay, for World War II. Hegel he he right. was 1800s, so, and then uh, right. Heidegger was World War II. So post-World War II, this turns into the hippie movement. This turns into, we're free of all structures. We're, we're good to go. We're happy. We can make the world yeah. we want to make. Following that, it turned into... Um, uh, AIDS crisis, but keep in mind, these people are still largely radical, right? These are... Mm -hmm. The radicals yeah. on the fringe of society, uh, little bits and pieces of it are sprinkled into the pop culture and throughout uh, certain yeah. things. You started getting, especially in the druggy culture, the Beatles, you know, et cetera, you started getting more and more influence of that. But it was still generally positive because it was like, wow, uncharted territory. We're going to use our hum uh, humanism to to uh, dominate all of this. Right. Then we yeah. get um, we get a. Uh, 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 Vietnam, we get, um, and we get out of Vietnam and they largely take the credit for that. We start getting into the AIDS crisis. We start getting into all kinds of other stuff throughout the eighties and nineties. Um, and then we get to grunge. Grunge is saying, okay, you've built the world. We're not any happier. Mm -hmm. You built the world you wanted to build in the sixties. We're not any happier. I mean, look at, um, quote, 
uh, Nirvana and Kurt Cobain. Load up on guns, bring your friends, it's time to lose and to pretend. Uh, I'm overwhelmed and self-assured, I know I know a dirty word. Like, look at it through that lens. Most people just know those words yeah. just because they're in Smells Like Teen Spirit and the song is catchy and whatever else, right? Yeah. With the lights out, it's less dangerous. Here we are now. Entertain us, right? <laughs> it's it's mm-hmm. it's it's a send-up to um, a lot of the things that were being said in 1984 and, you know, uh, other uh, George Orwell stuff and, you know, all that other kind of yeah. stuff. And so they were taking it and basically saying, not in a conservative way, but in a, we're lost. Mm -hmm. What do we do? Right? Yeah. And it was all philosophy, right? They're saying, Mm -hmm. none of this is fulfilling us in our human nature. Mm -hmm. And we don't know what to do. We're just lethargic. And so when emo came around, it was because a younger a, a a basically like millennials to Gen Z, one generation further, mm-hmm. experienced 9-11, experienced the hurt and the pain of a world gone crazy. Right? Yeah. And they said, oh, snap. I was having fun. I didn't necessarily agree with Nirvana, right? Like, I was just Mm -hmm. living it up and happy to, you know, I'm living in a material world and I am a material girl, right? Mm -hmm. Like like that song. They were in that camp, even if they didn't know that song because they're younger or whatever. But the point is, then 9-11 happens and they start writing songs about the hopelessness of it all, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And eventually people start to forget, start to blend genres, start to blend uh the alternative rock which was now which is mostly now known as divorced dad rock for whatever reason on like TikTok and stuff like that. It's home and when I'm here. You know, it's 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 your three doors down, it's your creed, it's your, you know, the the, the nickelback, all that kind of stuff, right? Like the the gruff vocals, they call that divorced mm-hmm. dad rock now. <laughs> Which I find pretty okay, funny. Um, and then there was skater punk, right? And so all three of those mm. sort of blended together. And the one that people remembered, because it was the most absurdist, absurdist is what I should say, uh, mm. stylistically and all the rest, was emo. The mm. actual... Uh, that was probably one in every six to a dozen people actually one in every six to one dozen people dressed emo most people actually were in the hip-hop culture during Mm -hmm. uh 2001 through you know 2009 right like most of the most of the the fashion was actually hip-hop but none of that really Mm -hmm. stuck around but the emo did because it was the craziest yeah right um and this is another, yet another, I won't go too far into this tangent, but that's because you, you got stuff to say. But this is another reason for Christians being involved in bold fashions, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, with my hat and the, the, all the other stuff that I'm yeah. constantly talking about. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> you really thinking about this one, huh? <laughs> yeah, I am. It's. So I, I'm trying to draw, trying to draw some lines, mm-hmm. and again going back to uh, what Farley has said mm-hmm. um, in regards to the era where swing dancing became a thing. Mm-hmm. Not 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 like trying to keep us on that, but just drawing lines and connections. It was the Harlem Renaissance. And right. mm-hmm. the, the thing that he says never gets talked about is how important the churches were to the Harlem Renaissance. Right. Mm-hmm. Because all of these people were meeting through church mm-hmm. and were basically that, that type of big band music is jazz and church music. Yes. Being mixed. Mm-hmm. Specifically black church music. Yep. Gospel music. Yep. And yeah. So... Was that the last time? 
I, I know that uh, I think it was also Farley. I swear I listen to people other than Jason Farley. He's just <laughs> really eminently he quotable. He's, he's wonderful. Um, but he says that the last time that uh, the church and the state talked was the American War for Independence and the Constitution. Right. Mm -hmm. That was the last time that the structures of church and state talked to each other. I would, I would argue, I would argue with that just slightly. The last time that they talked was when the last um, church, official ch state church, closed, which I don't remember exactly when that was. It was like eighteen twenty-eight or something. Yeah, so a little bit further out, but that was really, truly, okay. actually, the last time. But, but it was that era. Yeah. That, that, that founding yeah, era. totally, yeah. yeah. Within 50 years, yeah. Mm -hmm. what, was the last time that the church and the culture talked the Harlem Renaissance? Um, And did Prohibition have anything to do with that? Yeah, Prohibition was a big one, but that has more to do specifically with parties, I think, specifically, okay. than with um, music creation. I think it had okay. some effect on music creation, but it was slightly different than its effect on parties and the like. Um, and the church's view of parties and dancing and <clears throat> cavorting and all the other sorts of stuff. Because um, all of that cavorting was a... a cavorting is a wonderful word. I love to cavort. Anyway. Um, <laughs> but, uh, okay. So, I would argue the most recent time that they have talked is actually in the 90s through the two to the through the 2000s in one particular I'm looking particularly at music okay? okay but going to different types of culture we could argue different things but in music specifically soft rock for all of its ills and not greatness and some of its goodness and whatever else I think was heavily influenced by christian rock um through from from the 2000s through the through or the 90s through the 2000s the thing is a lot of people would claim that it's in reverse but the thing is you cannot name me a soft rock soft rock act from the 90s besides maybe hootie and the blowfish <laughs> but even that's stretching it a little bit um that actually like didn't just take their whole thing from a christian band or a christian artist or you know like your stephen curtis chapman's and your michael w smith's and that sort of thing in the 90s and then later on um bands like um third day and other sorts of things they had a heavy influence on the so on soft rock as a genre and not only that but most of the best soft rock artists especially of the late 90s early 2000s were your creeds um and and there were other bands like creed where they had a lot of christians involved right mm -hmm. um where they would have a rock edge to what they did but what they did was mostly actually closer to like a a a more laid back than like a hair metal power ballad, but basically a power ballad, right? Okay. Um, are you are you are you kind of get getting what kind of music I'm talking about? Like, um, yeah, 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 yeah. I yeah. know exactly what type of music you're talking about. Yeah, and um, and, and 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 I would also say you too had an influence, but I think that they, I don't think Christian music was just all trying to be you too. <laughs> I think that you too was before it. There was a lot of bands that took a lot from you two in the Christian uh, situation, but they were also trying to be singer songwriters and they were trying to have a rock element without going so over the top with the distortion and all the other stuff that they could be accepted within more fundamental circles. And as a result, that created a mellow center for uh, soft rock radio, easy, easy listening sort of stuff, um, which... Yeah, it's a squishy middle, but we kind of need that too. We can't all just be completely on the edges. So I have to give some yeah, cre the, the, some credit there. The, yeah, the, this is the uh, simple <clears throat> uh, simple pleasures instead of not, right. not guilty pleasures, not high art, not not you know, yeah. Sistine Chapel ceiling. Simple. Yes. Good, but simple. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. I would I would say Lifehouse in that conversation too. Lifehouse is an exceptional band, 
dude's a Christian, stayed with a label for a while as a quote unquote secular artist, but kept pushing the boundaries and ended up, you know, continuing in the Christian music situation. He's one of the few that didn't go, uh, okay, fine, I'll just make thing. I'll, I'll just even everything out so that the label's happy. Like, no, I'm going to keep pushing the boundaries, <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and, and everything. So, but yeah. Okay, so two questions. Mm-hmm. One, do you consider the uh, uh, 90s Christian soft rock uh, to be the church, like the, like the church interacting with culture? Do you consider that to be like mediated? Because I'm thinking specifically of uh, some comments from Rich Mullins about, no, the, the, this is not church. Right. The, go go this is not the church yeah. this is entertainment yeah no this i, I good, love that clean from rich yeah so uh, that that would be my first question and the second question is what are your opinions on uh the only one that i know i'm not sure if there's more like him is uh nf who is very obviously a christian in his lyrics if you're a christian right like if you understand biblical language it's all over the place right but he's very much not a christian artist his, his fans aren't christian fans he, he's just you know right a rapper right i honestly don't much. So those would be my two questions the second one i honestly don't know much about him so i can't comment too too strongly um i know him but it's it's not something i'm super familiar with i couldn't name a song you know anything like that okay. so um i can't either <clears throat> That's okay. That's I okay. Just know, I just know of him, and he seems to be in that kind of vein of Christian artist, but not capital C Christian, capital A artist. So let me put it this way. I believe Franklin doesn't exist without the church. Franklin is the Christian music capital, Franklin, Tennessee. They okay. are suburb of Nashville. They do their own thing, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, but they don't exist without the church. And when I say that, I'm not talking the officers. The officers have had very little to say to the music industry because they have been trying to strip away their responsibilities to the world and double down focus on their own congregations, usually, although sometimes that doesn't even happen. Sometimes they're just yeah. directly to God. They have some kind of responsibility and as a result they just have to act a certain way in their own personal private life and as a result or and personal public life and so that has to be a certain way and then this is that this is a, a stripping away all actual physical responsibility in the name of um a form of gnostic uh neoplatonism um yeah a, in favor of a vague general piety right mm-hmm um, I think it's honestly laziness more than anything amongst officers. Probably. I'll be honest. I'll be honest with you. I think that's the number one issue is laziness. Um, the, the but, but, but the church itself, the lay people of the church have spoken into that soft rock space and they have, specifically added their own elements to it otherwise we would not have um and i would argue even in the 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 praise and worship scene where we get these you know endless bridges and all this other kind of stuff that we have these days like there is a regardless of what you think of it there is an art form to it like there is a yeah. pattern that they are doing and it has I, I I think there are a couple examples of this formula working really well with differently, slightly differently structured lyrics, stronger lyrics, but really like pushing home that sort of euphoric atmosphere that they're going for. Right. That can happen. Yeah. Um, and, and this is like a music musical choice, right? Um, also like lyrically and whatever else, this has been shaped by, not just executives, but artists too. Yes, the executives want to boil everything down into a formula. But where did the formula come from? Where did the proving okay. ground come from? It came from artists like 
Rich Mullins, Stephen Curtis Chapman, Michael W. Smith, and then later on some other characters, you know, and they wanted to simplify and break down. That's what the executives always want you to do. Take what you did that's beautiful and complicated and simplify it for the largest, widest audience possible, right? And yeah. there's a certain level of that that needs to happen because artists are weird. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> but a lot of the time, the temptation is to, quite frankly, castrate the artists of what makes yeah. them artists. And so I would argue that the church still does speak into culture, but it's whispering. And it's lay people mm -hmm. who are and doing the whispering. So not on an institutional level. No, 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 no. We are okay. we are good lay people employee slaves of all of the institutions because okay. that's what we were raised to be because we were told that it through the through through the 80s 90s etc we were told by the televangelists and the people who were of televangelist quality even in reformed circles that don't worry we're fighting everything up here you just be faithful where you're at. Yeah. As opposed to, no, we need as many people at the top as we possibly can. We're dying yeah. out here. You know, no, just send, send us more money. Keep, keep being faithful in your job, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. There's that aspect, but also it is true to a certain extent. You've got to be faithful in the things that God has given you to do, whatever that might be. Yeah. And God gives yeah. us more cogs and gears than he does leaders. Right. And so yeah. the, the, the hard, hard thing is you can't argue that the church hasn't had some influence. The problem is we're not raising artists. This is one of the biggest problems. Artists is one category. There are other categories, but let me, let me emphasize the artist because this, this is the podcast we're on. <laughs> um, the artist is not being told to fight for the integrity of themselves, their family, and their vision. Mm -hmm. They're not. They're told that is a worldly exercise. Rich Mullins dealt with this, right? Like this, they're told that it is a worldly exercise in ego to try to get your way with your boss. Mm -hmm. When you actually are being uh, conscripted for your artistic integrity. Yeah. <laughs> right? You are actually being enlisted and conscripted, however you want to put it, employed for your in artistic vision and integrity. And then they tell you what they want you to make. This has to be a give and take. And you have to fight for that which you believe in. But when you're not teaching your people, your congregants who are artists to stand up to COVID-19 pandemic outbreak stuff that is so clearly anti-gospel keep you out of church yeah and so many other i mean i could go down the line the things that we we, we tell them no just sit back down and shut up yep <laughs> right we cut them yep. off at the knees constantly and tell them just to be a good soldier just get in the back yeah. no, no every layman this is this was what the the, the Re Reformation was based on, largely. Yeah. Was yeah. that every layman who can read, can read and must read the Bible for themselves and be a Berean and try to understand yeah. it as best they possibly can and associate with those who believe the closest to them. Yeah. Why do we take that in the Reformation and go, yay and amen, yet we don't do it and we discourage artists from doing the same in the category of the arts well you said it earlier we're gnostics right we don't believe art really matters we, we, we do we yeah we, we we do encourage people to do that mm -hmm. in the privacy of their own home and <laughs> in their own you know little head and own right. little heart right that's where we encourage people to do that we don't ever encourage them to say okay well how, how does how does this doctrine this verse, this passage, this book apply to the way that I go out and actually live my life. Mm -hmm. 
And we don't give examples because we're afraid of being legalistic. Right. Right. And we're, there's... We're so afraid of being legalistic that we're functional antinomians. Yeah. Yeah. I think that there is something to certain aspects of that where, uh, if, for example, I've been doing this audiobook talking about... Um, uh, Spurgeon's Sabbatarianism. I won't name the book or anything yet, um, just for sake of whatever. But yeah. it talks about how um, it talks about how Spurgeon was really hardcore about Sabbath keeping, but he also never specifically never gave a list of things that you must not do on the Sabbath because yeah. to do so would basically go further than the bible yeah right yeah and, and so there is a, a a grand liberalism that the bible gives us a grand liberality that the bible yeah, gives us absolutely and that is something we have to be careful of but at the same time we should have been telling nirvana what to do <laughs> yeah and the people who, who who listened to nirvana and, and obviously generations before that too but we should have been telling them the reason you feel the way you do is because of this. And we didn't. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Good gracious. Let me see what time it is. See what we got going. Uh, we got about 10 minutes or so. We got I'd say. An hour of footage. Yeah. We, we got, yeah. we got about an hour or so. Um, so we could do 10 to 30 minutes max, whatever. Um, <clears throat> but like, I want to circle back a minute. The, So nowadays, the people who are in control of um, mainstream media, not just news, but all the other, you know, big time entertainment industries and things, they seem to just, they're trying to do what many people did to um, the existence of homosexuals in media they basically just never mentioned them um mm -hmm. and basically just they don't exist they act like they don't exist um this went for a lot of other things and minorities and other things which is what lead, lends credence to the whole ideas that they put out there it's not good credence it's not actual credence but you know what i'm saying um yeah they are doing that now to christians just don't mention them don't yeah. act like they don't exist you know, um, we're not even engaging with them anymore. Yeah. That being said, the culture still has a general idea overall of what a Christian looks like. And it is either one of two things. One, they are kind hearted, simple minded, wishy washy folk. Mm -hmm. Or they are uh, dangerous Trumpians. Um, yeah. hateful and tolerant bigots. Hateful and tolerant bigots, basically the dude from Footloose, <laughs> right? The 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 pastor from Footloose. That's the that's the straw man. Yeah. Um, the thing is, with that being said, there is still a place within the culture that where people clearly know what it is. They haven't phased out mm. Christianity's influence on the culture. It's just yeah. that it is largely considered irrelevant in the same way uh, experimental music is irrelevant within the music industry. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, it's not fully irrelevant because there are still Christian radio stations, as as messed up as they are. There, there are still Christian publishing companies. There are still Christian this and that and whatever else, and they make money. Yeah, um, they're they not a lot of money, right? A lot of a lot of money. Um, they, they make way more money than people think they make. Exactly, and so I, I going back to what you were saying about when was the last time church and culture intersected? I don't think they ever fully stopped yet. We don't have the church speaking into the state except in very groundbreaking ways like your Durbans and your um who's your who's your official who is of that camp who's in Oklahoma now Dusty 
Is it Dusty Devers? Dusty Devers. Yeah, Dusty Devers. Yep. He's y'all, yeah. y'all's neck of the woods. Love that guy. Awesome. Um, awesome guy. Yeah. And so, like, there are groundbreaking situations going on that mostly come out of what people are dubbing Christian nationalism because they think that they can straw man them with that, right? Like, that's mm. that's the play. Some of them yeah. are obtuse and racist and whatever. And then most of them mm. are just this is the way that they've chosen to express it because they're owning what was given to them. Um, yeah. The roundheads moniker was given to the, to the um, Cromwellians, you know, and the like during the English civil war as a pejorative and they went with it and you know, whatever else. So like it can happen. Yeah. You know me. I think that it's a theonomy versus, uh, like the theonomy thing is more based in God's law. The yeah. Christian nationalism more we, in localism. We already We've already had. Yeah. Come on, people. Let's use it. We don't have to make a new one. Right. Right. Exactly. The one is historically <clears throat> odd. Is this one? Right. But at the same time, I'm happy to be counted among their number if yeah, they need me. Absolutely. Um, it, yeah. <clears throat> it, it, if a Christian if a Christian nationalist asks me if I'm a Christian nationalist, I'm probably going to say no asterisks. Right. If a secularist or a really squishy Christian ask me if I'm a Christian nationalist. Yes. If the blue hairs want my such and such. Anyway. <laughs> if, if, the blue hair, if the blue hairs ask, yes, I am. Thank you very much. Um, if, if the actual people who believe it ask, probably not. Right. Not by your definition, at least. And so my point is that's rediscovering dead ground and trying to take it yeah. back. That's actual like front yep. lines kind of stuff. I think that we are in a space with the actual culture at this point where we have just forgotten how awesome Christian culture used to be. It's yeah. not taught. And I'm talking recent Christian culture. <laughs> yeah. Right? There's there's terrible examples of all kinds of horrible hymns, especially from the beginning of the 20th century. But there are some bangers that come from then, too. Yeah. And there are some absolute bangers that came from post-1950 um, that are yeah. legitimately theologically sound and wonderful and in hymnals and everything, you know? Um, and not just those. I'm not sure about the in hymnals part, but anything Rich Mullins taught. Well, in my Cantus Christi. <laughs> um, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. There's, there's some, like, uh, your James Montgomery Boyce kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. Um, and things of that nature. So, um, but generally speaking, like all we've been fed is how bad and terrible you guys are at making art. <laughs> when, yeah. when really we've just forgotten a lot of the great stuff that's come out. I mean, the, what was it? Late forties, the Hobbit came out or was it early fifties? Uh, I think it was 39, 39. So the, that far back, but yeah, I yeah. One still oh, still oh, oh, that's on that one. that's not that long ago. Yeah. And if you're not counting the cult the church having effect on the culture or, or talking with the culture through J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. 37. Right. Okay, 37. So if you're not counting mm -hmm. the, I know you were talking like er, slightly earlier than that, but like if you're if you're not talking J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis like on a massive mainstream scale through their fiction. Yeah. I think you're missing the point. You know what I mean? But a lot of people do miss this. They forget this. This is why largely I, I, I am hammering home all this stuff about uh, all this stuff through poets at war is like mm -hmm. the church has been impotent. Yes. It's not what it used to be. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more fluff out there than actual solid meat to sink your teeth into but the meat still exists it's still there you still got phil lawler ready to go to write some amazing story i mean you give that dude yeah. a budget like as much as i disagree with him on ai art and all kinds of other random things like the fact is you give phil lawler a budget and tell him create a film yeah. trilogy <laughs> good gracious yeah <laughs> you're gonna get something unbelievable you know um, we're we're, we're going to get something that will rival Lord of the Rings. Right. Uh, at Maybe least the not film. In scope, but right. yeah. yeah, the films is what I'm yeah, talking yeah. about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because mm -hmm. I'm 
pretty sure I'm on record saying Lord of the Rings is the best film trilogy of all time, and it's not even close. Right. Star Wars is a second. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Those are the only two in the running. <clears throat> as far as live action, I would put animation, uh, yeah, yeah. To- Toy Story in the running. Uh, the, the yeah, first three. In- including animation, Toy Story is in the running. Yes. Yeah, because Toy Story is a trilogy. There wasn't a fourth movie. Right, exactly. Or, or fifth or anything um, of that. And there's, not, yeah. there's, there's not going to be a fifth movie. There yes. isn't. They, the only thing, um, as far as I'm concerned, the only thing that exists in Toy Story universe outside of the three movies is the uh the buzz light your the original buzz light your star command series <laughs> okay well, what what do you think about the uh the like short films that they put out on abc the like 30 minute vignettes because i think that those are at least fun <sighs> they're not toy story quality but they are fun that's the thing they, they they're not toy story to quality the <laughs> they're not toy story quality um the only thing that was a worthy spinoff in my mind was buzz light your star command series and that's because it yeah. wasn't toy story it was something entirely yeah. different it was completely different yeah. <laughs> so um but yeah yeah and also i love patrick so, War- warburton as buzz <laughs> i think i think him and uh tim allen th- they're like they're like uh uh christian bale and uh and and michael keaton they're the best <laughs> You know, I know. I know we don't have as many other buzzes, but good gracious, they 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 gave you two different looks at this character in such beautiful and unique ways. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. So you were saying if you're not counting uh, Lord of the Rings and Chronicles of Narnia, then you're kind of missing the point, and that's entirely fair. I might be yeah. missing the point. Um, the the thing that I was thinking though is the church as an institution. Sure, because. That that was that was how the church was involved with the Harlem Renaissance, from what I have been able to glean. I haven't looked right. into this. I need to. I'm well aware, but the church as an institution was involved with that because people were meeting in church, mm-hmm. and they were centering their activities around their churches. Right. That and so it was church on an institutional level. Right. Tolkien, you could argue. Obviously, he was very Catholic. Obviously, the Lord Mm -hmm. of the Rings is a work of Catholicism, even if he didn't intend it to be. Right. It absolutely is. Um, I would argue small C Catholicism even more so. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. yeah, I I would agree with you. Um, But I I, I think you could argue that he was interacting with the world more as a scholar in his publishing of Lord of the Rings and Hobbit than he was as a representative of the church as a Christian. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and is sim- in a similar way, uh, with, uh, Lewis's fiction. Mm-hmm. Like, obviously he was way more pop level, um, and way more specific, uh, way more, uh, noticeably Christian in his right. flavor. Right. But it was still not as a representative of the church. So, okay. Were we fighting the church or the state more in the reformation? That's a trick question. Uh, the lines were blurred. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's a trick question. The, the, there, there wasn't a church state di- uh, differentiation at that point. Right. In time. And so there was a differentiation that needed to be made. Yeah. And necessarily, both of those institutions not only had to be differentiated from each other, but also from the layman. The problem is we have not reintegrated the layman properly. I buy that. Both into the state and into mm-hmm. the church. Because that was the goal of the Reformation. They accomplished the one goal of separating the church and the state. They accomplished that. They accomplished putting power in the hands of the layman. They did not accomplish giving the layman a legitimate and significant enough reason to cause him to care any more about the state and the church. As a result, everything that was not explicitly enumerated under the jurisdiction of the state and the church was designated to the layman who said, oh, I don't have to do anything with the church or state. I can just be a layman and make art. 
I can be have a farm. I can have a family. Hmm. Why do I have to care about my fellow man? We're not following. Is it second commandment? No, no, not second. What is uh, love thy neighbor as thyself? I'm just thinking second because the, the second two greatest, greatest commandments. Commandment. Yeah, yeah, second greatest commandment. That's what I'm. That's what I'm thinking. We're not given incentive by the state or the church to love our neighbor as ourselves. Hmm. Think about it. If you yeah. were to go tomorrow and preach the gospel to your next door neighbor, not that you deserve an incentive Mm -hmm. because there's an incentive in itself, but what are the institutions Mm -hmm. doing to encourage and incentivize you to do your job as a layman? Nothing. Nothing? Yep. At all? At all. There are people who are doing it because it's the right thing to do. And they are never recognized by their individual congregational church. And they are never recognized by their county. For what they have done for their county. There are people Hmm. who have read for 30 years in a library to children the best stories that they could possibly curate. And they're kicked out for drag queens. If you are not in an office of the church, officially recognized, or an office of the state, officially recognized, and even some of the offices aren't even recognized, like your poet laureates. Yeah or your worship leaders in certain churches. Right. I'm not saying that's an office of the church proper. Yeah. Right. But I'm saying that's a role. That's a real role. The people who constantly come in early to fill the communion trays. Yeah. How are they incentivized? We're, we're taking servants for granted across the board. The reason that people don't care about the institutions is because the institutions don't care about them and vice versa. And everyone is more comfortable and happy that way in the current system. Leave me alone and I'll leave you alone. Quid pro quo. <laughs> I, I have I, I have nothing intelligent to add to that. Um, that's definitely more to think about. For sure. And this is why it's important to and, uh, subsidize more of what you want. You know? Okay. In every so, in every aspect as a layman with your own power. Okay. So hmm. Does that mean, I doubt that this is going to happen. I think that we're going to have to, like, have some structures burned down first. (laughs) Of course you do, because that's, that's your, that's the drum you keep beating. (laughs) No, no, this, this is not, this is not one that I actually, I I don't want this to happen. I I, I want to, I'm not actively for this happening. This Burn. I was um, waiting for a reason to light my lighter, just because it's a fun fidget. Anyway, <laughs> I could go. I could go grab mine. Anyway, um, go ahead. <laughs> but I don't want things to burn. For the does, record, yeah. Does the church need to start on an institutional level, like hosting dances and stuff, because there aren't any more ice cream socials held at the town hall? Is that something that the church needs to start doing? The county needs to do it. The church needs to do it. The institutions need to do things that are positive outside of their jurisdictions that are not official, but with the backing of officiality 
for people to actually take them seriously. The thing is, they're doing all the wrong sorts of things, such as all you have to do is sign up for the program, right? And, And do the things we tell you to. They use it as a carrot and a stick with welfare. They use it as a carrot and a stick with foster care right this is this is why i don't completely reject the classical liberals right i don't completely reject them out of hand it's not everything that i prefer but when you actually break down the jurisdictions there's much more space within the jurisdictions than people give it credit for. They are taking it as a negative, you know, rule, whatever. They're they're basically saying, like, these are the only things that we can ever have stuff in. This is what the libertarian pushes for, right? Yeah. Yeah. The the state can only do these things. Well, one of those things is to reward good. Yeah. And how can you reward good if you don't incentivize good? In other words... You incentivize good, not by sitting there and waiting for somebody to save a cat from a tree so he gets the key to the city, but actually saying, this is the key to the city, everybody. This is going to be given out on this period of time, regularly, for somebody who does something great as an award. And it has monetary value. You can sell it. You can do, you know, whatever. It's actually made of something valuable, right? Um, yeah. And if you want to keep it, you can keep it. If you want to sell it, you can sell it. But it's actually of value. And it gives you um, some amount of standing um, to be heard above, uh, even up and above other people in, like, the, the, the Congress, for example, right? You know, they'll hear you before other people, right? Um, simple things like that, right? We care about you. You mean something to us. Does that make sense? Are we breaking up? Yeah. Okay, you got it. Okay. No, 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 no. Uh, that. And so this is the same thing for the church. We need somebody to volunteer to teach this six to eight year old Sunday school class. Mm-hmm. If you do, um, we uh, have some artists on retainer who can come and enjoy your family or or entertain your family, right? Um, There's things you can do. You know, that's really outside the box, right? But there are things that you can do. It'd work. Right. It would because it's of value, right? Um there are things that the church can give of value to people without it being just straight charity. Brendan's yeah. asking if we're still going. You want to you want to see if he can hop in? Yeah, let him in. All right. I'll, I I hey, can't hey. I can't do it. I'm going to need you to do it because of the recording. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But you yeah. got it. You got it. Yeah, absolutely. Um but yeah, I mean just tell him he can pop in. We're still recording. Yeah. I don't care if this one goes long. If you're okay with it, doesn't matter yeah. to me. I, I'm 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 more than fine with it. I ha- I have the last half of my Tuesdays blocked off for this. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. That's so far outside of my wheelhouse. I mean, rewarding good is not just acknowledging good. <laughs> it's not. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you're you're absolutely right. And this is So I, I know that I've said this before, but my my journey was politics mm-hmm. in about 2018. Yeah. And then 2018 to 2020, 2021, somewhere around there was all politics. Right. And then 2020, 2021, somewhere around there, uh, primarily thanks to Steven Crowder, um, I found theology discussions. Mm-hmm. And here I am. 
And right. it doesn't seem like I'm leaving theology discussions anytime soon. Right. Because I finally hit I, I finally hit bedrock. Right. Yeah. Um and I can start mining. Mhm. But this is not being spoken about. <laughs> if no, we, it's not. If like, we the, don't the, reward good, if we don't make good uh good acts, actual good works to be um profitable to people, then how can we expect and this isn't the it's not like that's the only reason but that's a heart thing that you deal with as a discipling method right the point is if you really want someone to believe that doing good is of benefit you need to in some way reward it subsidize it show them that you actually physically care about what they're doing yeah and that can be as simple as a thank you card it can be as yeah. robust as we had a surplus in our church that we want to give to you because of the amazing thing that you did yeah you know what's wrong it's hold on one second let me let me mute anyway yeah. Um, I'll do my, uh, while, while Joshua is, uh, talking with Casey, I'll do my best to kind of fill you in on where exactly we are. Take so line, first of all, we started, uh, start. by talking about social dancing and basically just social interaction and how that, that needs to be brought back, um, somehow. And we ended up branching off from that into the origins of swing dancing and how that had to uh, so do with the Harlem like Renaissance. And I asked now, the question. For some reason. Jason Farley has said on Mox Unplugged that the last time that fault. the church interacted with so. the state was the founding of America, effectively. Okay, that's not what I want. Uh, the, the creation of the Constitution and the uh, state churches of the colonies was the last time that the church and the state Maker. talked in the conversation of history. And so I asked, <laughs> are you okay? Mm, I'm fine. Continue. Um, and so I asked if the last time the church and culture talked, like formally talked, was uh, the Harlem Renaissance. Because Jason has also said or talked about how important the church was to the Harlem Renaissance because all of the artists met through church. And uh, big band swing music is effectively... Uh, jazz mixed with uh, specifically I black church music, spirituals and the like. And that's what that is. Also, I have it backed up so, elsewhere, okay? my question was, is that the last time that the church and culture formally talked? And we've been riffing on that for a while. <laughs> Basically talking about the structures right, and how uh, the formal institutions have failed uh, both the church and the state there that there there's is. no longer ice cream socials held at uh, town halls or anything like that or or an analog it doesn't have to be exactly that but there isn't an analog to uh positive social interactions uh that have a bearing of officiality to them because oh yeah the this structure, this institution, put a stamp of approval on it. Said, "Yeah, okay, yeah, you can absolutely go to that." All, all, all the homeschool parents aren't gonna have a problem with it because it might be, you know, the the dreaded party that you see in the, uh, the TV shows and all that type of stuff. That those don't exist anymore. And so, the question. Uh, I they do. You just need to know where to look and what they look like. Okay. Um, because they don't look the same. Um, so, um, you have to realize I'm a wasp through and through. Mm -hmm. White Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Mm -hmm. I know nothing about the Harlem Renaissance. I know jack all. I have spent the majority of my focus on Europe. Mm -hmm. And... Basically, everything after the American Revolution is in history. It's current events. Fair enough. 
Um, but uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm visiting my in-laws in South Dakota. And so I'm going to have to, and we're leaving tomorrow to uh, <laughs> drive 12 hours home. Uh, and so that's going to be fun. But um, that means we also have to pack tonight. So, And it was my brother-in-law's birthday. So that's why I haven't been here. But um, Happy birthday. I, I'm not about to argue with Jason Farley because he's an incredibly smart dude. Also, I need to be on his good side. Um, <laughs> uh, for, for, for future plans. Um, but the... Um, so I can totally say, you know, like, sure, yeah, that was the last time America, like the church and the state talked was with the founding of the American Revolution or, or the founding of America. OK, sure. Um, the Irish might argue with that, but whatever. Um, I'm not about to take their side right now. The Harlem Renaissance could have been the last time that the church and culture talked. But mm. for me, the... If it did talk, it was a, uh, it was uh, two people making eye contact on a subway and saying hi to each other before they move on. Okay. Um, like I'm not now. How does a church and culture officially talk? How does a church and state officially talk? I don't know, right? If you're talking about an institution, America wasn't that. Um. America was a, um, it was how strongly the church influenced those people as they were making it. And where did, where did they get the ideas from? They go back into history, look at the great thinkers and those great thinkers were Christian, right? right. Um, you can, you can draw the parallels with the Harlem Renaissance where they're pulling from their African, uh, church music to make their, new swing music so okay yes you've got the parallels there you can make that argument um but well this i is, don't i was just gonna say this is I what no this is what i was saying to him in that the reformation essentially was a was was several things it was trying to bring power back to the layman and it was trying to dissolve the blurred lines between the state and the church um, and make them clear jurisdictions and have the layman have a, his own clear jurisdiction, basically. That was kind of the everything else category. Um, and so in that, I was telling him we have in many ways, we have lost incentives to do good things as a layman. The layman yeah. ends up saying, oh, I don't have to be involved in the church or the state. Good. I'm good to just be by myself. I don't have to be yeah. integrated into society. Right. That was kind of the point that I was making with him before you came on was was all of this sort of stuff. And so for me, like uh, while the church, meaning the body of the church, the lay people still speak into the general culture, even as far as I was making the argument to him, the soft rock uh, stuff on the radio through the nineties and the two thousands, right? Like that they, you, you can make a claim that you two had an influence, but like the soft rock thing really came about because of Christian music, you know? Um, and, and so the, the, the and no, I don't, I don't think that they were just emulating you two either. I think that there was, there was a real give and take. Um, but the thing is like, they're whispering into the culture, they're set they're they're tr not trying to be big wigs they're trying to be good little employees um especially in the art categories because they think that's how you get ahead that's how they've been taught you get ahead um not that you have to be coat thro cutthroat or anything but like this is the and i told him you can't discount what people like lewis and tolkien did you know in the in the 30s through the through the 60s basically right um yeah. And and their impact on everything. But like those are mostly laymen speaking into the culture. He's asking about like officers, basically, is the way I'm seeing it. Not so much the institution itself, even though that's the way you've been pushing it. But the way that would happen is officers in the church yeah. would actually speak into the culture. And I'd argue yeah. there's a couple that are doing it now, like your Durbins and your Wilsons and people like Dusty Devers, who's one of the what is he, a congressman in your 
in your yep. state? Yeah, yeah state congressman. Congress. Yeah. And so, like, there are or, people who are, but this is groundbreaking. They're going back and, you know, this has been a long time coming. Anyway. I will be right back one moment. Apologies. Right Welcome to the Variety Show, where we have no clear <laughs> well, structure. About especially it. this week. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, you were saying that you don't ever hear the incentivize what is good brought up. Mm -hmm. Legitimately, the last time I heard anybody brought uh, bring up incentivizing the good in anything other than a negative context. For context, I listen to conservatives. <laughs> we rail against subsidies. Yes. Um, rightly. Subsidies. Yes, bad totally. Thing. Totally. No go. Um, but a form of incentive, nonetheless. Um, the last subsidies should it, come out of about... surplus. Let me be clear on that. Subsidies okay. should come out of surplus. Fair enough. And everyone has a surplus of something. I believe that wholeheartedly. Yeah. It's not always yeah. money. Mine is imagination. <laughs> yes. You know, so like very, very clearly. Yeah. Yours yeah. is imagination. Exactly. Um, but the last time I heard it talked about uh was not Phil Lawler, but Marshall Younger. Okay. Kidsboro. Mm hmm What is that? Yep, the Kidsboro episodes uh of Adventures and Odyssey. I don't think I've heard those yet. Are those yeah. fairly newer? You've not uh they're two thousand and eight. Yeah, I don't know if I've caught up so... that far. I, I was listening through it, for a it, while. It, yeah. Yeah. But, but it, yeah. It, it was in the gap, uh, if I remember correctly, it was in the gap between uh, Best Small Town and uh, Take It From The Top. That makes sense. Okay. I, I'm, I That was right but, around yeah. where I stopped. Anyway, but yeah. Yeah. But that's the last time, those <clears throat> episodes are the last time I heard anybody bring up the government is supposed to promote what is good in anything other than a negative context. Right. Right. It's always subsidy bad versus, like yeah. I said, subsidy comes from surplus and surplus alone. <laughs> yeah. It, <laughs> right. It's either subsidy bad or the lefties saying we need to promote homosexuality. Right. 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 Whatever the flip. Right. Th those are the two sides. There, there's not. No, no, no. There is actually there, there is an objective good and we ought to be doing we ought to be promoting it via official means. Right. Yep. And so, like, like I was saying, um the church doing it is so outside of everything evangelicalism stands for. <laughs> yeah. Um, like the idea that um, the church should reward good service in any way, shape or form outside of the pastor himself. Um, yeah. Is basically completely foreign Yeah. Go ahead, Brendan. Have you seen it in places? I've seen uh, some in no. my church personally, I, I, but I just I wonder if the reason that also apologies, I don't have my headset or microphone. I okay. wonder if the reason that's the case has to do with how simplified the teaching of what God and his universe is, has become. Okay. It's like, it's like that one question C.R. Wiley asked of, well, what do the angels do? Mm -hmm. You know, we have these concepts of guardian angels. We have Gabriel, you know, in the Bibles, we have messengers. We've got all of these instances, but the lion's share of the evangelical church attributes all acts at all times and all places directly to God through his direct intervention. Okay. And if that, and that is true, but it lacks any nuance mm -hmm. and the result from my perception, I perception could be wrong. I'm more than willing to admit that. But from my perception, I'm wondering if the result of that particular mindset is we don't need to reward people for good work. If their work is good, God will reward it himself. Which is lazy on their part. Oh, yeah. yeah. 
right? I'm not and saying it's not. Lazy and or greedy. And I'm not just yeah, talking not monetary, obviously. I'm talking, um, I, I told I told Alex, um, imagine a church that says, you know, we really want to reward you and your family. We see that uh, you've been, you guys have been, you know, filling the communion or doing whatever, you know, uh, very faithfully for a number of years now. And so we have a couple of people in the church who are artists who we have on retainer, and we would like uh, uh, to have them come and entertain your family in your home. Like that's so completely out of left field. Uh, yeah. And yet there's so much good and beauty and truth in all of that. Um, and it's, it's completely biblical to do for the church to do something like that. Um, we talk state briefly, we talk church. It's like the institutions themselves, even beyond those, you know, to the, what did, what did Farley call them? Not the, not the, uh, governments, the, th the, the, f the three of the four governments, but what is yes. the, the, no, there's, there's like the journalists. What are they called? There oh, estates. Estates, the estates. Yeah. Estates. Um, when you get to the estates, they can be doing the same thing, right? We can yeah. reward good as individuals. We should subsidize out of our surpluses. Like I was saying to Alex when you were away, I believe everyone has a surplus of something. I think you can actually find that in the scripture. God gives a surplus of something to everyone. And whatever your surplus is, you should seek to use that surplus imagination is one of mine in my case right like to serve other people so i can't sit there and you know reward my daughter who's you know a subject of my jurisdiction for being particularly helpful on a day with very much as far as money or material possessions or that sort of a thing but i can go out of my way to specifically record one of my stories for her to listen to or i can go out of my way to make sure that she has extra time enjoying television or she gets a special treat at walmart <laughs> you know what i'm saying like there's there's so many little things like that and my whole thing is you should not expect good things from doing good because it is a reward from God to make the world a better place through the ways that he has prescribed for you to do. But we as a recipient of good should return good to it. Mm -hmm. That's two, two that, things can be true. Two yeah. things can be true at once. Right. You shouldn't be doing good works expecting to be rewarded right and if somebody does something good to you you should reward them right they are not mutually exclusive right mm -hmm. in fact they yeah. must go together this is my life for yours and this is the this is egalitarianism in a lot of ways this is the the breaking down of these sorts of things because i think of the game ball like if you've ever played any kind of sport or you've ever seen a, a sport played even in a movie when you have a player who d who particularly changed the tide of the game the coach gives like the main ball that was used during the game to that person as a trophy, essentially. Okay. It's called the game ball. Yeah. That's the concept that has been railed against by the, you know, participation trophy type people um, over the years and has fallen out of style in many places, but in some places it's, you know, cause a lot of conservatives play sports. It's still, you know, a thing. And I'm arguing for the game ball, which the point of playing the game is to win the game and to work as best yeah. in your role on your team, right? To the best of your ability to win the game. You're not playing to get the game ball. But the game ball is to incentivize you doing particularly well in your own individual role. And God applauds this sort of incentive incentivizing all over the place. Well, I think I'm going to wrap here, but I will say one one other thing, and then we can just talk whatever if we have time. Basically, um, my dad ended up having to stop calling the inflatables that we used in DJing. We would do inflatable guitars and microphones and things as incentives. That's what he started calling them um, for the children to dance and do a good job following along. He had to change the name because, well, my kid deserves, you know, X, Y, Z, right? That was the that was the thing we were constantly dealing with, even when we called it incentives. But he specifically 
uh, labeled it that in the contract so that the people who hired us would see it that way. We are giving these out of our own volition, not from your, you don't have any right over this just because you pay, you're paying for us to give these out, not to have the right to give them out. <laughs> right. And so, um, that was, that was something we specifically had to do. And I, I think, yeah, if anything that came out of this, it's the goodness of incentives. I think that was what we ultimately came out to. And it came back to dancing. Look at that. Um, the DJing and the dancing. So any which way, everybody be your family's bar. Do not turn to the right or to the left subsidize out of your own surplus for your family, for your church, for your County, for everything else that comes after that. We'll see you next time in the trenches on poets at war. <laughs>